righty, we want to uh, greet everyone in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, we're thankful to the Lord for everyone that's here today. And we, we look forward to sharing with you the things that the Lord have laid on our hearts to share. We pray that everyone had a good weekend so far. You know the Bible uh, talks about the way of Balaam and the way of Balaam was simply this uh, if you remember Balaam who was the who was a uh, who was a prophet that the Lord uh, I guess different things that he would say would come to pass and so uh, one of the nations that when Israel was passing through a certain nation, um, that the king of that nation uh, tried to hire and hired Balaam uh, to curse the children of Israel because he said that what, whoever you curse is cursed and whoever you, bless, whoever you bless is blessed. And so I want you to curse this people because they are a mighty nation and it's clear that God is with them, so curse them for me. And so he tried to, of course, you know the story of Balaam. And the Lord told him that he could not curse them uh, because they were blessed. And so what Balaam was doing, if you, if you read the story in, in its entirety, uh, he would go up to the mountaintop and look down on their backsides. Like he would look down uh, where he could see where they were, their, their rear, as for, for, uh, their backs. And in his mind, he thought, if I'm standing up here looking at the back of them, I can curse them. And what he was doing, he was uh, basically trying to look at their flesh, if that make any sense. He was observing them um, on the outside of grace. And of course, God's grace and mercy was covering them. They were going to be a mighty nation, regardless of what anybody had to say about it. And, you know, there are times we read in the Bible where the Lord say, um, basically, I'm not going to save you for you. The only reason why I'm not going to destroy you is for my name's sake, because I've already put your put your name out there as somebody. And so don't think for one minute that it's got anything to do with you. This is for me. And so there were sometimes people were under the grace of God like that, but just because for God's sake, not because of, of them, if that makes sense. Now, that's to help us to get out of ourselves. And that's and that really goes for all of us, if that makes any sense. And so uh, they there are some people and that's that's what the children of Israel. That's the way he was with them. Um, he didn't just annihilate them all. Uh, Jess, and he would say also for Abraham, your father's sake or for David's sake. So it was some righteous man somewhere that, that it lived right, uh, and because of that, the children benefited, see. And so here, there was Balaam trying to curse them, and they could not. Uh, God would not allow, every time he opened his mouth to curse them, he would speak blessings. He couldn't help it. But then, something interesting happened. Balaam went back to the king and said, I can't, God won't let me. I think he tried three different times, and he told, told the king, God won't allow me to do it. God won't let me curse this people. But the way of Balaam was this. He taught the king, this is how you get them. He said, I can't curse them because they are blessed people. But if you get them to disobey God's command for them, then God will judge them. And that is what the Bible calls the way of Balaam. What's the way of Balaam? Causing people to curse themselves through their own actions. 
Now, let me make this clear. It doesn't matter how much of a Christian you are. It doesn't matter how saved you are. It doesn't matter what your grandma, how she prayed for you, your grandpa prayed for you. You can curse yourself through your own actions. Everybody understand that? So let's now let's let's bring this down um, to our level so we'll understand it. The sin. And just just to let you know whether or not maybe, you know, just in case you think, well, I'm I'm not out. uh, I'm not out cooking frogs. And eating them. I'm not out in the woods anywhere, you know, doing chants. I've never levitate, levitated or anything like that. <laughs> Let me ask you this. In the Garden of Eden, what was the thing that brought about the curse? What was it now? At, at the core, disobedience to God, right? So that's all it took, right? How many of you, well, I, and you ain't got to raise your hand. I just want you to think about what I'm saying now. How many of you had sex before marriage? Had sex outside of marriage? That's what your great-grandma did. That's what Eve did. And that's all it took for, her, for, for the rest of her people. Adam called her Eve because she was the mother of all living. And that's, that's all it took for the rest of her people. We, this ministry, we're on a graveyard right across the street because of what Eve did. So you don't need to be way down in generations and think, well, you know, it, it, it's not a crime anymore. Nobody looks down upon that anymore. All it takes, now, think about it this way. If you've had sex outside of marriage, how did your life go after that? Did you just take on the love of God? Or did you get hurt and bitter and angry and go more into promiscuity? That's a curse. Does everybody understand now? And so before we think that the only people that are cursed are people that's just knee deep and neck deep into witchcraft, Anything, let me put, just put it this way. Anything outside of God is a curse. It's just some is more obvious than others. But anything outside of God is a curse. Does everybody understand that? Look at, look at how people's lives go when they do certain things. Look at how people's lives go. Think about the mind, especially you young ladies. Think about how your mindset changed after you gave yourself to somebody that you weren't married to. Look at what that did to your mind. Look at how it poisoned you for the rest of the relationships that you've had since then. What else is a curse? (laughs) Does everybody understand that? When your mind, listen, the Bible says God is love, isn't that right? And so most of the time when women give themselves over like that, they're doing it for love's sake in their mind. I'm just going to prove to this person that I love them. And then look at what happened after that don't work out. Your mindset toward love get tainted. And if the Bible says God is love, then you can't help but your mindset towards God to get tainted. What else is a curse? When your mind have been twisted towards the very thing that God intended to use to save you, you see. Does everybody understand that? I want you to think about it. So if you could say, I've had sex before marriage, and if you could say my mindset was changed and tainted after experiencing that, and then if the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, then how do you accept that if your mind has been tainted towards the very motive that God had for sending his son? When your mindset is tainted in that manner, how can you receive salvation? When you giving yourself over to somebody on, in, under the guise of love was tainted. Does everybody understand? 
Do you see how it's hard to accept salvation when salvation is, is a byproduct of love and your idea of love have been tainted? Before a woman, a young lady, give herself over in that manner, she's freely given, the most loving individual, pure natured, sweet and kind. She's the same way she was when, as, a little, as a little child, just sweet, ain't thinking bad about nobody. And, and then she, she, she go that route, and then all of that, all of that changes. The, her very nature changes. Now it becomes about, now it becomes, I, I, I'm going to make sure that nobody uses me, which really translates to, I'm going to make sure that nobody knows that I love them. And so then you come to church, you hear the gospel, you get saved, but you still can't really grasp it because your mindset about love have been changed. I'll show you love when you show me love, which is not love at all. Cursed. Because now love comes with conditions. You got to show me you're all in, and then I'll show you I'm all in. And the whole time, see, it ain't, it ain't the individuals you're going to date after that that's really suffering. It's God that suffers. Because now your view of him is tainted. So how can you grasp a hold of him like you should? When your whole idea of love, in other words, God, has been tainted. Cursed. Do they understand now? And so we live in a generation now, see, where... People have learned to try, you know, to just get along with the curse. Don't know, it's one thing to be cursed. It's a whole other thing to not know it. And to just think that your life is just bad. Just think, does everybody understand that? Do you know, let me, let me show you one way you, 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 you gauge whether or not you're under a curse. Out, outside of what we just explained. In life, you can look at the lives of other individuals, J just in general. In general, if you want to know what areas maybe you're cursed in, just look at the lives of other individuals, just in general, saved or unsaved. They have certain points in their life where they've achieved certain things. Just in general. As they get older, they get more responsible. Their desires change towards more mature things. Just look at the people on side of you. And I mean, in your age bracket. Just in general. Just in general. Look at... If you've ever examined your life, you'd know I, I should be further along than where I am right now. You know, and it, even now, it, it's hard to look at people on the side of you because it's so much cursing going on that you can't hardly go by that. Look at your grandma. Look at your grandparents. Number one, what age did they get married at? When did they start having children? When did they own a house? Look at all of those things. I'm talking about the norm. Just, just the norm. When did they stop running the streets? When did they decide to settle down? Does everybody understand now? So you ought to be able to look at your life and, and gauge whether or not, like what the school system say, you're on track. You ought not to be in the 10th grade reading on the 5th grade level. And I'm talking about spiritually so. If, you, if you're in the 10th grade and you, you, you're still reading the cat in the hat, then you know something's off. But look at your spiritual life. Look at your, look at just, just look at people on side of you. And you'll see whether or not you're cursed. 
We have a whole society today where over 50 percent of women aren't married and don't care about getting married. <laughs> and the 50 percent that are married, if it's that much, half of them don't want to be. Cursed in the Bible. Not being married was a reproach to a woman. It was a reproach. It was something shameful. And fathers went out of their way. We see Jacob's father alone. No, you take the cock out one first. Now, I understand that you don't you didn't work seven years for her, but you're going to marry. You're going to get this one first. But see, now <laughs> the, the devil is so slick. You know, you got to give it up for him. He's slick because he's got people using curses as a lifestyle. What? Don't depend on no man. You cursed. You're cursed. You had to depend on one to get here. <laughs> Does everybody understand that? And so now we've adopted all of these mindsets. Whereas before, maybe we weren't cursed, but now the society in general have adopted a, a cursed mindset. Does everybody understand now? And how do you know you're under a curse for sure? Because things just keep getting worse and worse. Not getting better, getting worse. The first generation. Adam and Eve did something they weren't supposed to do. Just flat out just disobeyed what God told them not to do. The second generation, their children were killing each other. What was it? The tenth generation, God had to destroy everybody. <laughs> All of their children, except for eight of them. Everybody understand now? <laughs> it's cursed. And, and I'm telling you, we as believers, we better know something about it. We better know something about it. Does everybody understand now? I want to share something personal with you, just, just so you know what I'm talking about. Just, you know, in, in, in the area, uh, you know, in one of the areas in my family. Last night, I got a text message. Um, I imagine it was about 7 o'clock at night saying that a, a cousin of mine passed away. He was uh, maybe two or three years older than I am. Uh, I got a text message, um, I guess about two weeks ago, saying that he was in a hospital and uh, said he, was, he had some kind of infection and they were watching his heart rate and his breathing and things like that. Uh, but they weren't, of course he was in the ER and you know, nowadays can't, anybody just can't walk in the ER you know, anymore. And so uh, my sister texted me last night saying that he had died. And, you know, I, I talked with my wife about it before, and I, I honestly feel like there's some stuff going on there. But then I got to thinking, on my daddy's side of the family, I'm going to just, just, just from my, my, all of my granddaddy's offspring, my, my daddy's daddy. Now, I, I want to make it clear, I love my family. I, I really sincerely love my family. But I'm telling you, I see a pattern. I see a pattern. My granddaddy had five children, and he buried four of them. And of the four that he buried, my daddy lived to be the oldest. My daddy was only 52 when he died. His oldest brother died a couple of years before him. He was 50. Was laying in the bed at nighttime, told his wife, I I'm going to get up and use the bathroom. You don't worry about anything. You're going to be okay. Got up, went to the bathroom, and died on his feet. Closed the door behind him and died right there in the doorway. When the paramedics got there, they told my auntie he was dead before he hit the floor. He died standing up. So that was two. That was 1978 that he died, and it was 1981 that my daddy died. 1974, the year I was born, my grandmother died. My granddaddy's first wife, my, my daddy's mother. 
1969, my, my daddy's youngest sister died. She was 35, left five little small babies. 1960, my granddaddy's youngest son died. He was 23. He left two small boys. 23, 35, 50, 52. 1979, my granddaddy's oldest grandson, he died. My daddy's son. Does everybody see that? See the pattern now? And now we're on, see, I'm the second set. I'm from the second set of my daddy's children. So my granddaddy, my daddy had children who were old enough to be my aunt and uncle, if that make any sense. And so on, in my, on my daddy's side of the family, I'm a generation behind. My first cousins are in their 60s and 70s. So my second cousins are my age, if that makes any sense. All my first cousins, once removed, I guess, to be technical about it. And they're dying off. Tysha, he, he might have been about 51. 50 or 51. He's the one that died last night. You see the pattern now. You think something ain't going on? Now, wouldn't I be foolish to just keep going on in life? Like, oh, well. Somebody ought to be paying attention. And that, listen, I, I hadn't even listed half of them. That's not even half that didn't make it to 50 or 60 years old. Do they understand? So you have to know something's going on there. Now, I wanted to go over that to make you pay attention to the pattern in your family. Is divorce the pattern? Single motherhood, is that the pattern? The devil's got some stuff set up for your bloodline. It, listen, and the only way to escape it is complete surrender to God. With no compromise. Does everybody understand that? Because I'm telling you, one or two people, yeah, you know, I, I can see that. Sometimes the Lord takes people. John the Baptist was only about 30. Jesus Christ was only about 33. Okay, I, I, I can see that. That was just that time. But when you're talking about back to back like that, my granddaddy's two youngest children, my daddy's two youngest siblings, they both died because of car accidents. My daddy and his brother, both of them died of heart attacks. My daddy's son shot and killed sitting on the side of his girlfriend. You know something is, something is going on there. Something is going on. And I'm going to say this, even though my, my granddaddy wasn't one, and even though my daddy wasn't one, Masons run very deep on that side of my family. Now, we ain't going to go into a whole lot of detail of that. I know that might rub some people the wrong way. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, you know, at some point, as, as believers, we, listen, <laughs> you're the devil's best friend when you don't examine your life and the patterns of your family. He thrives on ignorance. He thrives on it. He's hoping that you're not paying attention. He's just hoping you just write it off as, I guess it was their time. What does this Bible say? With long life, what? I will satisfy you. With long life, I will satisfy you. Now, let's, let's, let's think about it this way. If the, if the idea, if it's God's idea for your life in this world to bring him glory, why wouldn't he want you to live a long life? You think he's just cutting off everybody in the family? Does everybody understand now? 
And so when I, I'm telling you, when I see certain things going on, I'm paying attention. Does everybody understand? We just, just because the whole world is going to hell in a handbasket don't mean we ought not to be paying attention. We ought to be paying attention to the patterns that we see. I can't tell you the, the number of second cousins that have already left here. My granddaddy's great-grandchildren great leaving by the droves and have gone. When I see things like that, I know some, somebody somewhere. Because listen, I believe my granddaddy died saved, but I don't believe he was saved his whole life. Somebody somewhere done opened up a door and made a pact with the devil somewhere, even whether it was knowingly or unknowingly. The devil's got a right and his hand in the family somewhere. And I'm telling you, I don't care how married you are right now. If there's a spirit of divorce in your family, you better do something about it. You ain't got to think love going to carry you through. <laughs> Does everybody understand that? J just because you can't, you can't see it, I'm in love with this person. I can't ever see it. <laughs> what does the devil care about what you see? I'm telling you, you as believers have to actively take a stand against the pattern that the devil have already started. Think about it this way. It don't mean the curse will automatically come, in on, come on you, but I'm telling you, if it's attached to your family, then the devil already have a running start. And we have to do something about it. Does everybody understand now? We have to actively stand against it. Actively. Not just hoping that it's God, God's grace and mercy surrounding me so it won't come near me. What did God say about his own people? They perish for lack of what? Don't know and don't care. I don't need to care if, as long as I'm following God. Don't you know, <laughs> this Bible say, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. You're wrestling. Does everybody understand that? Have you, any of you ever seen a wrestling match? Raise your hand if you've seen a wrestling match. Have you ever seen them just standing there? Does everybody understand that now? And I'm telling you, we as believers, God don't want us to be ignorant. Some of you sitting here, you've been wondering, what is the problem that I'm facing now? Where is this coming from? The Lord is trying to open your eyes about it right now. No, you don't have a bad marriage. You have a bad devil. Let me prove it by the scripture. The Bible says marriage is honorable how? In all, in all, in all. There is no such thing as a bad marriage. But there is a bad devil that people are ignorant to. Everybody understand that? So if the devil can get you to think my marriage is bad, he's already defeated you. Because you're placing the blame on an institution that God himself has sanctified. Ain't nothing wrong with marriage. It's the ignorance of the people in the marriage that don't know how to fight this spiritual war. You're going to have to learn how to fight against those principalities. Against that spiritual, it's called the wickedness. Where? In high places. You're going to have to learn to stand against that. And not just think love is going to carry you through. The devil don't care about how much you love your husband, how much you love your wife. That don't matter to him one bit. You have to know when the enemy's talking.
Peter had just got done telling the Lord, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. What did Jesus say? You're blessed, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. So the Lord knew there's another entity that revealed this to you. So you're open to the spirit world. But listen what happened now. Just within a few minutes. The Lord began to talk to them about him going into Jerusalem and being crucified and being mistreated. The Bible says Peter pulled him to the side and rebuked him. And what did the Lord say? Now you've given yourself over to some spiritual wickedness in high places. Get thee behind me who? So you think our Lord didn't understand spiritual warfare? He understood the same person that just got done blessing me. The same wife that just got done cooking for me and massaging my feet. She could speak something completely contrary. And I better know who I'm dealing with at all times. So no, your husband ain't bad. Your wife ain't bad. The devil is. You better know when, which one of them is up to bat. <laughs> Does everybody understand now? <laughs> so, the definition of a curse. See, we ain't even hardly got started. The definition of a curse is a solemn utterance intended to invoke a supernatural power to inflict harm or punishment on someone or something. Look at what it says, a solemn utterance. You know what that means? A curse has to be spoken. Somebody somewhere have spoke something. Now, that could be you. That could be your grandpa. That could be Adam and Eve. Somebody somewhere done spoke something. Now, I want you to think about, you know, one of the things we just brought up about marriage. Have you cursed your own marriage? And I'm going to tell you about words. They don't go nowhere until you snatch them out the air. With some other words, that's that's complete opposite of what was being spoken. That I love you and I do on your wedding day, that don't mean a thing. Two years later, when I wish I hadn't married you come out of my mouth. And listen, brothers and sisters. Please forgive me does not snatch that out the air. <laughs> does everybody understand that now? No, it don't either. If you are paying attention spiritually, you'll know uh, it's something off. It feel like it's something between us. I tell you what's there. The spirit that was invited to be between there. Does everybody understand that? So you can have two clean people get married and ain't done nothing wrong. And, you know, ain't never, you know, they get married. They're still not tainted and, and, and pure. And, and then they get to bumping into each other in marriage. And then they begin to curse their marriage. Now, <laughs> that, that's, that's way up there somewhere. Down here, you got two people that's done slept around and they coming in and cursed. And, and them, them, them curses are joining force. Think about it. When two curses marry each other. What, and, and then have children together. <laughs> so the devil got all of this junk piled up on people. All of his curse blankets. 
piled up on people. And in their mind, this is I just I don't know what to do. This we're gonna try to work it. We're gonna try to work this out. You know, that's the reason why marriages don't work out. That's the reason why not just marriages, but different things in people's lives don't work out because you playing the wrong game. You're wrestling against spiritual wickedness in high places. Not against your spouse, not against your boss, not against just life. Because see, what happens is people just try to make the best of everything. They have a raggedy life at home and ain't no good. Let's go on vacation and smile for two weeks. That'll fix it. Or I could get rid of all these curses and my whole life is full of joy. <laughs> Isn't that something now? Well, the devil got, got people settling. Got people so buried in junk. Got them settling for just being able to come up for air every now and then. That don't sound like the abundant life. I'm telling you, if I was living that life, I'd have to, we, me and God would have to have a meeting about it. Because something ain't, like my great-grandmother used to say, there's a dead cat on the line somewhere. Does everybody understand that, what, he, what, what that means? How many of you heard that term, there's a dead cat on the line somewhere? That means if the electricity isn't making it to the house. A cat done scaled the pole and started trying to walk across it and killed the lion. So the old people used to say, if it ain't no electricity here, there's a dead cat on the line. In other words, if stuff ain't coming to me that should get to me. If I don't have that abundant life that the Lord promised me, I come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. There's a dead cat on the line. In other words, something ain't adding up. And what do we what did, what did they do when they said that when they meant that there's a dead cat on the line? They went and walked. Let's go see if we can find this dead cat. When my wife and I when we lived in it lived in Antioch, you, it wasn't a dead cat. It was some squirrels. Constantly killing the power to the house. Constantly. You hear this. Zzz, get the candles. Because, see, we had a transformer somewhere by our house, and they'd, they'd run across there and, 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 I guess, get electrocuted. So at some point, see, we have to realize, because, listen, isn't that the ploy of the devil? Look at you. You gave your life to the Lord. Where's this abundant life you thinking you got? What have changed for you? He ain't going to tell you, but you know I'm cursing you, right? No, he just got you think that's all got you thinking that's all God's got. He ain't got nothing to give you. You had it better. When what? <laughs> you out in the world. But I tell you what, if you bring your curses into the kingdom of God, you won't see any difference. And so, and the Lord means what he say. My people perish for lack of knowledge. Do you want to know about these curses or not? <laughs> Does everybody understand now? So the definition of a curse is a solemn utterance intended to invoke a supernatural power. When stuff ain't going right in your life, when it's not going according to God's word, there is a supernatural power involved in your life that's resisting you and resisting your advancement in life. Do they understand now? I sincerely believe my wife and I have a good marriage. I believe we got a really good marriage. But I tell you this, it didn't start off that way. I'm going to tell you, you know, the first thing God did, I, I can tell you like this. The first thing God did was move my wife around the people she knew. Moved her right away from them. 
got her out of that gumbo pot of curses. Because he knew I'm only one man. I can't fight against a whole family of them. <laughs> Does everybody understand that? And I, am, I guarantee you we'd be divorced right now if she had stayed where she was. We'd be divorced if we were going to visit there every few months. Because you know what happened? She go down there and all them demons come to her side conjuring. Come on, we strengthening you. You, you mean you tell me you serving that man food? You done changed. Well, she'd have been awoke somebody. <laughs> Does everybody understand that? So the Lord in his infinite wisdom, if he don't want you smell like gumbo, he going to pull you out of the pot and then rinse you off with his word. <laughs> so when, we, when she got up here, I could deal with her. Let's deal with you. And, and I'm telling you, in the first part of our marriage, every time we got into an argument, some devil from Louisiana was going to call. Just, just got done. Where even she understood, okay, I, I see what's going on. So I'm glad you see it. What was the Lord doing? Breaking that curse. Sisters, it ain't the man that's supposed to leave. It ain't just the man that's supposed to leave and cleave. I want you sisters to pay attention to that. Every time you feel like you and your husband ain't getting along, what do you want to do? Let me call mama, see how she doing. Let me call my friends, see how they doing. Let me call the devil, ask him for some more demons. I need, I'm, I'm getting weak. <laughs> and they'd be more than happy. Oh, I, I, I was just building a house, but I got time to talk. You ever stop and think, is something on the inside of you know that it's losing? And it needs to be strengthened? The devil knows when the curse is about to get broken. And that's all of a sudden, uh, you know, for you, it, that's when your family all of a sudden want to be family. We family. We ain't talked in ages. We need to get to know each other better. What's, what's your name again? And if you're not careful, you'll think, well, somebody, at least somebody care about me. <laughs> yeah, the devil care. He, he cared not to go to hell by himself. <laughs> Does everybody understand that now? Look what it says, a solemn utterance intended. In other words, there's an intention. It is on purpose. You ain't just out walking out in the public somewhere and walking into a curse. Every curse that's sent out is intended for its particular victim. So you don't have to say, well, you know, yeah, my mama, she got divorced one time. But she, she's happily married now. Yeah, to somebody that don't mind the curse. Does everybody understand that? My, my family is coming up. 
No, they've just adjusted to the curse. Does everybody understand now? So, <laughs> when you think about curse, you add an O in between the C and the U, and what word do you come up with? Course. A curse is a spell invoked by a devil to get you off course. That's what a curse is. It's designed to keep you from experiencing what you're supposed to experience at particular times in your life. To get you off course. Does everybody understand that? And we as believers, sometimes we can know we're off course, but we're blaming it on God. God is, he's just waiting. He's just, I haven't experienced this yet because he's just waiting on the right time. Or maybe there's a spirit there. Do they understand now? And listen, brothers and sisters, our disobedience to God, God's word, it automatically brings a curse. Automatically. That's automatic. Does everybody understand now? We disobey in anything. We automatically, that's what, that's what introduced the curse into this world. Disobedience. And so how do we think we're going to, we thousands of years away from that, and we can disobey and not invite curses into our lives? Disobedience to God's word brings a curse. Does everybody understand now? I'm going to go over a few of my stuff. That all right. When I was 12, the Lord told me to start preaching. I was in the seventh grade. And he did it in such a way. One day, One, one evening, I knew for sure that I was going to die when I went to sleep. I knew when I went to sleep, I wasn't going to wake up. That was for sure to me. And I was so sure of it. Now, if you imagine in a 12-year-old mind, what is a 12-year-old thinking about dying for? I, I had no doubt in my mind I wasn't going to wake up the next day. No doubt. So much so that I tried to keep my siblings up to play with them. Because I was sure this is our last night together. And so I, I you know, I, they just all started dropping off, just falling asleep. And I, I was the last one to go to bed and get in bed. And uh, I remember laying on my bunk bed and I, I prayed, Lord, if you let me wake up in the morning, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. Just if you just let me wake up in the morning. And I had a dream that I was standing behind a podium looking down at it like this. And I, I remember shaking my head like this and saying, I don't know what to say. I don't. What am I doing up here? And then I heard the voice of God say, don't be afraid. And then I woke up and I sat up. And then the voice continued to say, because I am with you. And that was my commission, 12 years old. So I went to school the next day. There was a janitor there who was a pastor of a church. And I went and I told him and his deacon, I think they were some can. And I said, I, you know, I believe the Lord called me to preach. And they, and, they, and they both, you know, I remember them stopping what they were doing and pulling me to the side and talking to me and saying, well, son, you better do it. Son, if the Lord have called you, you better do it. And they were real encouraging. Still, I think they both still alive. Reverend Stafford was one of them's name. And uh, Deacon Hamilton was the other one. I, can't, I don't know if that one's still alive or not. But I remember them both just pulling me to the side and said, Well, son, if, if the Lord is telling you to do that, you better do it. 
I said, yes, I, I guess I will. And so my countenance, I was really, really happy that the Lord had woke me up and he was going to allow me to do that. Not that I really wanted to preach, but I understood the concept then, preach or die. If you ain't going to do what I called you to do, I might well go and do, what are you on this earth for? See. And so then fast forward, you know, apparently my countenance was so happy. I went to that, that summer, we went to my grandparents' house on the other side of Louisiana, and I'm just walking around happy, and one of my uncles, he said, boy, what are you so happy about? What are you so cheery about? You know, now you think about it, that, that just shows you what my countenance was, because aren't all 12-year-olds happy? They playing with their first cousins, it's family reunion time, aren't they all happy? But it was something different about me. And he could see it. Boy, what are you so happy about? I said, I'm going to preach. The Lord called, he told me to preach, and, I, and I'm going to preach. And then somebody sitting in the room, whose authority I trusted, said, he ain't, he ain't called to preach. And that, and that was it for me. I ain't called to preach. So I just, just backed on up, backed down, didn't. Okay, I'm not going I'm to tell you something, brothers and sisters. You can change the course of people's lives with your words, maybe because you're not in a place yet. That's the reason why I encourage children. Does everybody understand that? If they have a desire for anything, if they read in the word, they ask me a question, I'm going to try my best to answer it. I'm going to give them just as much of attention as I give adults. Because they can go through years and years of trying to circle back to the point where they were discouraged. Does everybody understand that now? And so there I was. Okay, okay, I'm not a preacher. So if I'm not a preacher, then what am I? I'm a sinner and I'm going to do it the best I can. Does everybody understand that? When, when you step out of God's purpose for your life, you automatically start living the devil purpose. That's what the curse is. So, a few years later, five years later, <clears throat> I joined the Navy. In my mind, I'm going to make a career out of this. But at the most, at the least, I'm going to pay for my own college. That was, that was my thought. Joined the Navy, went, in to, went to basic training in August of 1992. In January, when I got out of basic training, I, I went home for, for leave, went to see my papa, my, my mother's daddy, and uh, he said, come on with me. So I went with him. He took me out to the graveyard. He sat down and he took me to a particular part and he was building a tomb for six coffins to go into. That was in November of 1993, in 1992. In January of 1993, he was in it. So we spent the whole day out there finishing this tomb. And he was the first one to go in just two months later. I didn't know at the time that he was sick, but he knew it. And maybe the adults knew, you know, the, the children and his wife, but I didn't know he was sick. I, you know, Papa was just Papa to me. So that was in November, January, I think the 12th, he had died. So I, at that time, I was stationed in Virginia. I put in for leave, and I'm not thinking anything about it. I went and bought a $500 plane ticket. I put in for leave to go, but they said, no, you just come out for leave. And besides that, he's not your immediate family. We only guarantee immediate family. And so then I said, well, he's my, he's my last living daddy. My daddy had died, and my daddy's daddy had died. This is my last living daddy. Oh, no, he still can't go. So then I told my immediate supervisors about it, and they went before a board and fought for me. And they came back and said, no, you can go. We got you approved. You could go. But by the time they got it approved, my plane had took off. And there was no refund for the ticket. So 
okay, I'll bite that bullet. Still happy-go-lucky about the Navy. Still in here, see, still, still going to do it and be the best sailor I can, see. So then orders came, time, time come to choose orders, and I chose California. I chose California, San Diego. At the time, I was in Virginia, and at that time, the Navy was paying people uh, around $3,300 if they had a vehicle to drive from the East Coast to the West Coast. So I graduated from A school on March 12th. I went to get my orders, to, to literally get the papers for my orders and the check. Guess how much the check was for? A hundred and fifty-eight dollars. What, what, what? Am I gonna make it out of Virginia with this? Did California move? <laughs> what is this foolishment? Oh, they didn't tell you. Your ship is in Mogadishu, Somalia. And so we're giving you $158 to drive from Virginia to Maryland. To Delaware, rather. Because that's where you're going to catch a plane at, to go to Mogadishu, Somalia. What am I supposed to do with my car? That's not our concern at all. Not our concern at all. Okay. I'm, I'm trying. Trying to be a good sailor. <laughs> what the song say? I ain't a killer, but don't push me. I leave out March 13th. In the day March 13th. And there was a big snowstorm on the East Coast, March 13th, 1993. Because, see, it, it socked me in the gut. I had plans of driving to California on March 12th. So when they hit me with that, I, I got to sleep on this. Let me go sleep this off because I don't want to be mad driving. The next day when I wake up, well, March 12th, it was sunny outside, a pretty day in Virginia. March 13th, March 13th, there's snow everywhere and you can't hardly see nothing. So I get in the car and I start driving. Okay, let me hurry up and get out of here. So I, I, I call my uncle down in, who's stationed down in Georgia, Fort Garden. I tell him, I, I'm coming to your house for a couple of weeks and then I'm going to fly from there up to Dover Air Force Base in Delaware. He said, okay, come on. So I start driving about four hours into my drive. Because keep in mind, the visibility is low. Some old couple stopped right in front of me in the middle of the highway. And before I saw them, I'm sliding into them. Slide into them and total my car. I get out. We exchange information. I can still drive it. I called my uncle. I tried to call him and let him know what happened, but I guess he was at work. And I just kept driving. Lord, just let me make it. Lord, just let me make it. Lord, just let me make it down to Georgia. So I made it down to Georgia. Made it to my uncle's house. He came out and looked at the car. My uncle lived in a real prestigious neighborhood. You know, you can't leave that. It, it'll be here for a little while, but you can't. We're going to have to get this car saved. <laughs> so, okay, I'm trying. You know, stuff happens. I understand. Life ain't going to always go the way you want it to go. So then I, two weeks later, I get on a plane. I fly up to, from, from Georgia up to Dover Air Force Base in Delaware. And I fly out of there. We fly through Spain and some other different parts of the world and uh, I get on that plane March 28th and the whole time I'm in the air I don't get off the plane until until March 31st no break 
we were flying over in enemy territory, and all of a sudden we'd hear this loud thump and clinking and some other rattling. Well, what is that? Oh, that's us fueling up six miles in the air. Had another plane come and land on top of ours, and that's how we got fuel. So I, I land in Mogadishu, Somalia on March 31st, uh, 1993. Land on the coast there, because of course Mogadishu is on the on the coast. Looking out, out into the into the to the sea, yeah, and ask the captain out there. He said, "Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, that's your plane out there. That I mean, that's your ship. That's got to be the USS Horn out there." So y'all are just in the morning, you know. Y'all eat some, you know. We got there about three o'clock in the morning. They say so in the morning y'all eat, and then we'll you know we'll get a helicopter to fly y'all out to y'all ship out there. You know, sitting off of the maybe a mile out there. So the next morning come, we wake up, we're happy. Okay, we're finally getting to our ship. We look out there, ain't no ship. And then they tell us that wasn't the USS Horn. But anyway, that's not the USS Horn. Here's your M60 rifle. This is the way you load it. This is the way you unload it. Wait a minute, I'm not, they didn't, I'm not a, they didn't, I'm not, I didn't join the military to kill nobody. I'm not, I don't know nothing about no M60s. I, I, this is not the kind of training we know how to swim. <laughs> well, you're in Mogadishu, Somalia. You're in a war zone now. Okay, so this is how you load, this is how you unload it. Okay. Oh, and by the way, every morning when you wake up, this is, they're going to give you a password. And if you're stopped during the day by anybody, you have to know the password and you have to say it within a few seconds because if you don't, they could bring you to the commanding officer or they can shoot you on the spot. Why are they telling me that? Because I look like a Somalian. And they had people coming in, killing some of our people. Does everybody understand now? So, you had to have a good memory if you didn't have one. So we stayed there for about a month. And every night we went to sleep. I, I don't know what anybody else was doing, but I slept with my fingers in my ears. Because our camp was right by the runway. And they had loud jets coming in and not just any jets. They had steam powered jets that ran off of boiling water. Now you imagine the little teapot and how much, how much noise it make when it's steaming. Now imagine a 200 ton machine steaming. Yeah, so like this. We were so close to the runway that when the jets come in, we could feel the heat in the tent. As if Somalia wasn't hot enough. thought this is tormenting and then on top of that the base that we were on it was a marine base marines don't like people in the navy so every time we went to eat we'd go and eat on in their galley and then we'd have to all huddle off to ourselves hoping we don't all get jumped on because see when you overseas it, they don't play by the rules that they play by over here you can die over there and oh, just, just friendly fire, something bad happened. That, cause see, that happens all the time. They'll ship your body home and, you, and it all beat up and, and your family won't know what happened to you. Just, you know, this is just wartime. This is what happened. Just put a flag over their coffin. They gave, you know, they gave up their lives for the country. So we went through about a month of that. Then finally, the commanding officer got back to us and said, we found your ship. It's in Bahrain, in other words, Saudi Arabia. Okay, thank you, thank you. When can we fly out of here? We don't know. Got to wait on another plane. It might be next month, might be next year. We don't know. So we waited a few more days, and the plane came in. They flew us out of there. I, and I listen, brothers and sisters, I'm skipping over a bunch of stuff. I'm just letting you know what a, a cursed life looked like. Wasn't nothing going right. 
And I prayed that prayer again. Lord, if you'll just let me touch American Saul. Just let me see America again. Where they got some laws. <laughs> so we got on the plane. Me and my two cohorts. One of them's name was Martin, Chad Martin. He and I was, you know, we were friends for a long time. And I imagine we're still acquaintances. Uh, in our travels, he had a bag, you know, in the military, you had to stencil your bag. You had to put your name, your last four of your social security on everything. And I still got one of his bags. That's how close we were and that's how much I thought of him. So we got on the plane and it was just us three. If you can imagine, on the biggest, one of the biggest planes in the world, the biggest plane in the world, just us three. And the plane we got on had two stories. You get on the plane through the back, and at that level, all the tanks are on it. They carry tanks on those planes. We went upstairs, and that's where we sat, just us three. Now, you know me personally, you know, I get on the plane, I, I'm looking at people. And, and you know, and, and the size I am now, I would be one of those people I'd be looking like, nah, if, 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 if the plane start going, I'm gonna jump on your back. I'm thinking about the weight. Okay, yeah, we don't need to, we don't need to get on nothing with no tanks. Ain't, aren't they heavy? You know, all of this, because listen, here's the thing. When you're cursed and you're outside of God's will, anything can kill you. Why y'all didn't tell me y'all had trees? <laughs> Does everybody understand that? Oh, you careful about everything. <laughs> Why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> so I go to sleep on the top of that plane. I'm thinking I'm, I'm good and tired. They don't work me pretty hard in Mogadishu. I sleep for the next three days. Except I woke up to alarms going off. Smoke all in the, in the plane. In the, on the, I don't know what was going on, on the first floor. On our floor, it was smoke. And I'm thinking, well, surely they're going, what's going on? What's, why is there smoke? Oh, one of the engines on fire. Okay, so uh, what we do next? Y'all going to land? No, we can't. We're over in the territory. We can't land. And so y'all got guns for us to shoot ourselves and get this over with, or we got to ride this out? <laughs> 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 What's the protocol? <laughs> why we got all these enemies? And why are we flying over their territory? <laughs> that don't make no sense. <laughs> why, why are we everywhere? Why can't we just be in America? All these thoughts go through your mind. I tell you what. Uh, atheists pray in those situations. God, I don't know if you're real or not. <laughs> so we were praying. And we made it to Egypt. And we landed. And I thought, well, now they're going to get us another plane up in here. Except they didn't. No, we just, we just got to replace a few things. So we sat in Egypt for 12 hours, waiting on them to fix whatever they needed to fix, and then they put us right back on the plane. Then we went to, they flew us to Spain. We landed in Spain. But we missed, because the plane caught on fire, we missed the next plane that was supposed to have been going from Spain. So we spent two weeks in Spain. You think I'm not thinking about my 12-year-old self? Man, what, why? Spend two weeks in Spain. Finally, another plane came through. We flew through Italy. 
and then on to Mogad uh, then on to Bahrain and landed in the airport there. At the airport, I'm waiting for the command to come pick me up, me and these other two guys that were with me. And while I'm sitting there, there's this big commotion. And I hear all these people just gather around us. You know how they talk. What? Um, what's, what are they saying? What's going on? Are we, is, these, are this, is this enemy, is, are we friends with these people? <laughs> and they're pointing at me. And one of them that could speak English understood I was confused and I'm American and I don't know what I'm doing. They said, oh, he said, sir, he said, you're sitting with your legs crossed and your toes pointed towards another man's wife. People get killed over here for that because that's an insult to them. To them, that's like throwing a bird. But to those people, you know, you don't do that. That's, you ain't, it ain't casual over there like it is over here. So those people were ready to go to war over that. Okay, well, wh what can I do? How, how can I sit and live? <laughs> so then we get to get to our ship finally. And uh, there's a picture of me taking a, the day we landed on, got to the ship, it was the commanding officer's birthday. And it's the tradition in the Navy when it's the commanding officer's birthday, the oldest person take a picture with the youngest person on the ship. He was the oldest person and I was the youngest person. So we took a picture together on the ship. Cutting his birthday cake. He's still living in California now. He's a city councilman. At that time, you know, in 1993, he looked like he was 80 years old. <laughs> so I don't know how old he is now <laughs> but he's still alive because I, I, I look him up every now and then to make sure he's still living Captain Beeson was his name so my first week on the ship I get called up to the office that nobody want to go to say okay so what's going on now what's, what's happening now oh yeah this, this couple said you bumped into them in Virginia and they don't have your information. Look like it was just a hit and run. Oh, okay. So when does it ever stop? So then I had to write them. Sorry, sir and ma'am. I thought I exchanged them. I'm pretty sure I did, but they were old. Maybe they, I don't know what in the world was going on. But look, I'm just a young buck. I'm, I'm just, you know, I had to write a nice letter, you know, and I had to, I'm, I'm trying to find my way through life. I'm 18 for Pete's sake. I'm just, you know, how much I owe y'all. So I sent that, and that's the, basically that's the way they told me to write it up. You know, you're going to have to, you know, because these people, they could get you in trouble. So I, I wrote it up real nice for them, and they wrote back, okay, yeah, this is how much the wreck costs, and stuff like that. And they said, okay, well, y'all stopped in front of me, but anyways, to, to keep from getting court martial, I'm going to go ahead and pay it. So things happen, finally make it to California, and maybe about four, four months later. It's time for me to go and leave again. And so whenever we come off of what they call Westpac, or a six-month cruise, uh, they let you take a 30-day leave. Most people don't take it. They try to divide it up. But me, I had enough. I'm going to take my 30 days. Because that's how much we got 30 days out of a year for leave in the military. I don't know what it is now. So went on leave for 30 days. I come back to the ship and they put handcuffs on me. Oh, you're AWOL. What are you talking about, I'm AWOL? Well, we, you only got approved for two weeks. No, I got my paperwork right here. So I showed them the paperwork. Okay, well, let's take you to the commanding officer. So we go up there to his office. Now, you know, the commanding officer, he's like the president. You don't want to see him. 
If y'all understand now, with all that authority, he ain't you know you know you ain't getting invited up there for tea. We go to him, he, he, you know, and I show him my paperwork. I said I got proof, you know. So he said, okay, we'll we'll excuse that. But see, for, here's the thing: from that point on, they had their eye on me. See. By this time, I'm just about had enough. And so the next year, my brother called me, say, look, I'm getting married. I want you to be my best man. Okay, yeah, I'm coming. All right, I'm coming. I put in for leave and found out I wasn't going. No particular reason why, no nothing. Ain't, we ain't going on no more cruises. They don't need me just right away. Why not? Oh, just because. Now, here's the thing. See, in my 18-year-old mind, in my 19-year-old mind, I wasn't looking at nothing spiritual. I wasn't thinking I'm under a curse. And so my fight was with flesh and blood, with authority that I was not going to whip. If I had been spiritual minded, I'd have thought all of these things are coming upon me because I'm disobedient. But that's not where my thought was. My thought was, oh, so you want it with me? Why y'all picking on me? Does everybody understand that? No, it wasn't them picking on me. It was God doing it. You remember what I told you to do when you were 12? Oh, you don't remember? Okay, we'll just whoop on you some more. And so that's what happened. I got whipped and whipped and whipped. I got rejected. I got everything. Does everybody understand? So I, 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 they, they, they denied my leave. About a month later, I called my stepdaddy and uh, the, the man who basically raised me, him and my mother, they were married, I think, from 1984 to around 1988 or something like that. So he had a whole, a big part in my life. I called him and his new wife answered the phone. Said, uh, he's, he's, he's sick. They, he, they, gave him, they gave him six months to live. But I don't, she said, I don't think he's going to make it to that. And uh, she said, uh, you, you're John? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, he talks a lot about you and your brother. That's all he talks about is you and your brother. And just, you know, how, what good boys y'all were and things like that. And that, that just softened my heart. I said, well, I, I want to go see him before he leave here. So I put in for leave again. And guess what? It got denied. So at that time, that's when bitterness kicked in. Uh, brothers and sisters, it's dangerous to be cursed by God and then at the same time have an I don't care attitude. That's a dangerous cycle because if you don't care, why does God? Especially when he's the one that brought about the curse. Do they understand that? That curse and those things you go through is meant to make you repent and meant to wake, make, make you wake up. Not to take on this I don't care anymore. But see, that's what happens when you're not spiritual minded. So that was my mindset. I don't care. So I, things about me completely changed. You know, in the Navy... Uh, you, you know, they have inspections every morning when you get up. You know, you go, you, you stand at attention like this, and they come examine you, make sure you're shaved, make sure your gig line is right. And that, that means, so y'all see this shirt here? And you see this, uh, this, this line right here? That's supposed to, that line right there is supposed to match up directly with the line of my button where you button your pants at. I, I didn't care. I showed up to those inspections, shirt all out of my pants, hat turned sideways. I, st I wasn't standing at attention either. They got to the point where they just walked right past me. Just walk, because my mindset was this, you can't whip me.
So I just began to rebel. But it was to my own demise. Listen, don't mess with people that's pushing pencils. Don't mess with people that's higher up than you. They've been playing the game. Me, with my retarded self, I'm thinking, ain't no, y'all can't whoop me. Oh, no, we might can't physically whoop you. But listen, you know what they did? They lost my financial records. We can't whoop you, but we ain't got to pay you. We don't, oh, you come to get paid? We don't know where you, they got lost. So at that time, I just got a cell phone about the size of this Bible. <laughs> the kind you had to hold like this with the big antenna sticking up from it. <laughs> How many of you remember those cell phones? <laughs> just got one of those. You know, got myself in just in... I ain't going to say in debt, but just had responsibilities. And they, they've lost my financial records. So now I don't get paid. And I got to go to work still. So you know what I had to do? I had to get a second job. You know what my second job was? Selling children's books. I, I was going to the doctor's office. You know how you go to the doctor's office and you see those little books on the counter? That's what I was doing. Going, hey, hey doctor, you got some children coming to your office? Yeah, but they they read. <laughs> I tell you, the Lord will humble your mind. <laughs> I'm tough. Ain't nobody gonna whoop me in inspection. <laughs> but hey, Doc, you. <laughs> oh, it's funny now, but there was some crying going on back then. <laughs> <laughs> what is my what am I doing? <laughs> so I'd had enough. Had enough of working a second job because I wouldn't get paid. And see in the military, if you, when you don't pay your bills, the bill collectors don't call you. They call your command. Because in the military, there's this, there's this code of enforcement, and one of those codes is what they call Article 86. What, what is Article 86? Conduct unbecoming. And that's anything. Anything that makes the military look bad. That's adultery. That's not paying child support. That's not paying bills. And you can get kicked out for any of that. So... I had to go before the officer under, call, uh, under Article 86 and had to explain. Well, Bowden, you, 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 you better, I guess you better get a third job if selling them books ain't working. Well, how about y'all find my financial records? So for a whole year, I worked for the Navy and didn't get paid. You think God was trying to get my attention? Everybody see now? Now here's the wrong, here's the mindset not to have. Don't try to make the best out of the curse. Get out of the curse. Does everybody understand now? Listen, brothers and sisters, me today. Where I am right now, I can say this, there, there's nothing wrong with the Navy. There's nothing wrong with the military, just naturally. So does everybody understand that? It was me. Does everybody understand? See, because when you're cursed, that means you can be in the wrong place. What's the wrong place? Wherever God don't want you to be. At the wrong time? What's the wrong time? When God don't want you to be there? 
And what happens when you're in the wrong place at the wrong time? You're going to meet the wrong people. And you're going to take on some of the mindsets of those people. Think about it. When you're in the wrong place at the wrong time and you're walking under a curse, how in the world are you going to ever have lasting friendships? How are you going to get along with everybody except you're just trying to adjust and make the best of it? But you have to go back to ground zero. God, I'm cursed because I'm running from you. Does everybody understand now? And so to make a long story short, I just had enough. I'm going to Louisiana. I'm going to see my stepdaddy. Got down there. He died. Went to his funeral. That was in November of 1994. And then I decided, in the, and I called one of my friends who was in the military. He said, well, John, uh, you know, they've already court-martialed you because they, they, they figured you ain't coming back. So they've, already, they've court-martialed you, and they've already sentenced you to six months in the brig, and they're going to take $555 of your paycheck, every paycheck. How are they going to do that? Oh, yeah, they, they found your financial records. Mm-hmm. So I, I called my sister and said, well, I'm going to go ahead and go back in. I mean, I'm, I'm skipping over a bunch of stuff, but, you, you know. I said, called my sister and said, well, I'm going to go and go back in the, in the military. I'm going to go in and go back. She said, well, you might as well wait till Christmas now. They done already sentenced you. I said, you're right. I'm going to go ahead and wait. So you've heard the rest of that story and how all of that goes. But I, 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 I want to share something with you. Um, When you're cursed, you make irrational decisions. What, what, did I, what was one of the reasons I said I wanted to go in the military? To pay for college, isn't that right? Do you know when I was 17, on the day that I graduated, that was May 16th, 1992, my uncle, one of my uncles who was well off, I went into my bedroom and he was sitting on the sofa in my bedroom on the arm of it. He sat down, he put both of his hands on his knees, and he looked me in the eye, and he said, John, you don't have to go into the military. He said, I'll pay for your college. I, I, I'm going to pay for your college. I said, oh, that's all right, Uncle, Uncle Dudley. I, I, I'm going to go in the military. He said, Are you sure? He said, I, I, you don't have to go. I'm going to pay for your college. I'm going to pay for it. And I rejected it. And you know, when I did go to college, I racked up $50,000 of student loans that the Navy didn't pay for because of the type of discharge that I got. Does everybody understand now? So when you're cursed, you make decisions that go against logic. If I'm going into the military for the purpose of paying for my own schooling, there's a man that's got the money to pay for it, but I rejected it. Why? Because God wanted to whip me good. Let me flip that stupid switch on. So when you come out of this, you won't ever go back. Does everybody understand that? So cursed decisions lead to cursed locations, which also leads to cursed relationships. Everybody understand? And you know what was going on this whole time? I was becoming more bitter and more bitter and more bitter because that's what curses do. It causes you to get more bitter. Does everybody understand now? I did not know at that time that that uncle that was talking to me, that was my mother's oldest brother. I did not know that he had made a promise to my daddy on his deathbed. He went to see my daddy, when, you know, maybe a day or two, it might have been the same day that my daddy died, and told him, Big Hawk, do not worry about your children. I'm going to look after them and make sure they, won't, they don't want for anything. If I had known that, I might have changed my mind. But I didn't, I didn't find that out until a few years ago that, he had, that what he was doing that day in my bedroom was fulfilling the promise to my daddy, you see. 
So I had to pay for my own college. I had to <laughs> got sentenced to six months, but I got out in five because of good behavior. And they sure enough was taking that much out of my paycheck. I, I want to say this. The children of Israel, you read in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, you see one thing going on. They're mad at God because they wish to God they were back in Egypt where the flesh pots were. They're mad because they are miserable. Forty years, they're eating the same manna. Forty years. Mad because of this manna. But that was what by God's design. Because listen, they were only supposed to eat it for two weeks. It took them less than two weeks to get to the door of the promised land. Does everybody understand that? Yeah, that, that's about a 12-day walk from Egypt to the land of Canaan. 12 days. But they rejected God's will. And they had to suffer the consequences. Now here's the question you have to ask yourself before we close. Are you in the wilderness trying to figure out different ways to cook manna so that the curse don't seem as bad? Does everybody understand that? Or are you just going to get tired of the manna and just go on into the promises of God? In other words, leave the curse behind. That's the name of this message. Cursed. Are you concerned or carefree? So the children of Israel cur cursed themselves by disobeying God and not believing him. And they spent 40 years trying to reconcile, listen, and trying to make the best out of it. Or you can be like Jonah. Jonah disobeyed God when got on a ship. And when the ship began to rock and the waves began to he hit it and, and it looked like they were about to go under, Jonah didn't have to pray to his God. Jonah just said, I'm the reason. I'm the cause of this. If you get me off of this boat and just cast me over, y'all y'all have peace. Does everybody understand that? What did he know? I'm the reason for the curse. So then here's the question. Are you, do you know that you need to be out of that boat and get back in God's will to be relieved from the curse? Or, do, or are you just going to try to make friends with the people on the boat? Yeah, let's just, let's, let's just buy some more buckets and keep casting water out of here for the next 20 years. Does everybody understand that? There's people all over the world that live like that. Got water in the boat and it's always going down. And they're always glad at night that they can go to sleep because they've cast just enough water out of the boat to keep from waking up and sinking the next morning. But tomorrow we'll do the same thing over. We're just, this is our life. Does everybody understand that? At some point, we got to wake up. We got to go back to our 12-year-old selves. We got to go back to that place where the curse entered. Does everybody understand now? Because see, I, I saw kind of junk in California. That, that's the reason why I didn't stay there. Because I knew I wasn't supposed to be there in the first place. Everybody understand now? I saw all kind of stuff there, and even after all of that heartache I went through in the military, I could have said, well, you know what? I'm going to just find something else to do. Because that's what people do <laughs> a lot of times. Instead of them going back to ground zero where they got off with God, they just say, well, you know what? I'm going to make the best of this situation where I am. I, uh, no, I'm going to find something else to do. I'm going to do everything but be reconciled back to God where I need to be. And that's not God's will. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, it is not God's will for his people to be under a curse. It is not. If you know in your heart 
something is blocking your advancement in life, whatever and wherever that may be, you need to understand there is a demon there that's hindering that. And you have to do something about it. Does everybody understand now? When people are following God with their whole hearts, you, you, you know what's supposed to happen from generation to generation? The next generation is supposed to be better than the previous one. If my daddy owned a house, I ought to own two. Does everybody understand that? We ought to be advancing. Why? Because I, he passed down to me what he knows, and I'm going to gather some more knowledge about some other stuff to do. And I'm going to be a blessing to my children and to my children's children. But what's happening? That's been turned upside down. It don't look like that anymore. Dad is blessed, children's cursed. And from one generation to the next, it gets worse and worse and worse. Why? Because the previous generation of demons pick up some more. Does everybody understand now? So the word of God, the Lord tells us in his word that when an unclean spirit is going out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and findeth none. And then he says, I will go back to the house where I come from. And he says when he get back, he finds it what? Swept and garnished. In other words, God have helped the individual. But they didn't replace, play, replace that with nothing. They just empty. Okay, I'm not going to do that no more. But I ain't got nothing else to do. Does everybody understand that? And so what does he do? He goes in and he brings seven more with him that's stronger than he was. That's more wicked. So you imagine from generation to generation that's being added like that. God does not intend for his people to live under a curse. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, we got to get some sense about ourselves and we got to know when we're cursed. We have to know when there's a pattern that's been set in our lives. Does everybody understand that? Have any of you ever looked at somebody's life and thought, what's stopping me from being that way? What's what's stopping me? from experiencing that. You found out today. <laughs> Does everybody understand that now? Because I'm telling you, you're going to only live like, like that for so long before bitterness kick in. You're going to only live like that for so long before bitterness kick in. Does everybody understand now? And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, that's not God's will. If you're doing the same thing that your parents were doing, not only do you have their curse, but you're going to pick up some other ones. At some point, you have to make up your mind. It stops here. And we're not passing this junk on to the next generation. Folks, if, if we were all in the same room with my relatives, they wouldn't even know we were kin. Because my children are going to be different. Does everybody understand that? You're not going to know their kid to somebody else by their actions. We're going to be different. Does everybody understand now? That's God's desire. Don't you walk down that same path and just think, well, this inherited. Does everybody understand that? You're under a new blood covenant now. And it's time for God's people to start living like it. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the word that you spoke to us. And God, we pray that you will let these things remain in our hearts, O oh Lord. Help us, Lord, not to be carefree as if things aren't going on spiritually, Lord. We ask that you will wake us up. Help us to see those patterns, Lord, that maybe we've missed before. Help us to do something about it, Lord. We ask that you will lead us and guide us. And strengthen us, Lord, in this warfare that we're in. 
And right now, Lord, we ask that you will break every curse that have been sent our way. Break every curse, Lord, that may have been spoken over us. Break every curse, Lord, that we may have spoken over ourselves. Break every curse that we may have invited through our own disobedience. Right now, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we ask that you would change our mindsets, change our hearts, Lord, so that we don't continue on this course that we've been on that's contrary to you. Bring us, Lord, back to ground zero, even beyond our ancestors, Lord. Bring us back to your word and back to what's normal according to your word. Help us, Lord, not to accept dysfunction. Help us to know, Lord, anything outside of your word is dysfunction. Help us, Lord, please, to pay attention to those things so that we don't get in a routine of compromising with dysfunction and the curse. Thank you, Lord, for speaking this word to us. And Lord, we pray that you will bring it to our remembrance and help us to live by it. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, brothers and sisters, we want to say thank you all for being here today. We pray that something was said that have blessed you. If the Lord say the same, we'll uh, go ahead and dismiss you, and we pray that you'll go home and and um, meditate on the things that you heard today. If that's all now, you're dismissed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.